question from a variety of angles, a variety of perspectives, and many of those have had to do with sort of a, a heavenly perspective or a theological perspective. We've answered that question in terms of what is going on in the heavenly courtroom and in terms of theological language. But over the next couple of weeks, today and next week, I want to come back to that question from a perspective that has to do with this life, this place, these days in which we find ourselves today. How does Jesus save us in and for the here and now? In what areas of our life, in the living of our days right now, do we see Jesus saving us? And so, this little two-part add-on to the rest of that series will answer that question. How does Jesus save us in this life in a couple of ways? First of all, today we'll study how Jesus saves us to a life of purpose, a life of purpose in peace. And next week we'll look at how Jesus saves us to a life of purpose, a life of purpose free from regret. Jesus saves us to a life of meaning, of direction, of purpose that is free to a life of peace and free from regret. So in beginning today, I want to ask you to entertain the following question. What are your particular roadblocks to peace? What are those obstacles in your life that stand somehow between where you are today and the life of peace that somehow seems to elude or evade you? Or if you consider yourself someone who is not particularly troubled about most things, what is it that would lead you from this place of contentment to a place of joy, resting in the loving, joyful peace of our God? I know that there are many Christians, for example, who live lives full of anxiety, sort of an anxious spirit, an anxious moving through life is something that is a part of each and every day. Every decision, every relationship encounter is something that is full of anxiety. People spend hours a day dealing with worry, even those who have put on Christ. Perhaps anxiety for you is a roadblock keeping you from peace. Many of us deal with overscheduling as an obstacle. Those who live on the road or traveling from point A to point B in a calendar or those who are always bouncing from one commitment to the next sometimes find ourselves so hurried and harried that we cannot find peace in our lives. Perhaps you are one who cannot remember the last time you and the people who matter the most to you had a quiet evening together at home. Perhaps you can't even recall the last time that you went for a long walk with your best friend on some afternoon when the sky was blue and the birds were chirping and the flowers were in bloom. Perhaps it's been years since the last time you sat down to read a book or a magazine of your choosing and got so peaceful, so restful, not because of exhaustion, but simply because of contentment that you awoke a few hours later to find that, that book resting on your chest where you had nodded off in peaceful sleep. Some of us, overscheduling has taken a tightly fisted grip of control on our lives and will not let us go. It, it restricts us from peace. Others experience a roadblock in their physical limitations. There are people who have been convinced by some circumstance in years past that they are unable to do certain things. Or perhaps through a loss of, uh, a, a loss of strength or through a loss of health, people have begun to believe the lie that they are somehow worthless, somehow useless within God's kingdom purpose. 
and it's become a roadblock to peace. Others have stopped turning on the evening news. They don't take the paper any longer. They don't get online because when they see the news, they become overwhelmed by the needs in the world. Or they've withdrawn from their relationships that they have with others because they can't stand to hear anymore the litany of health concerns that come from family and friends and neighbors and co-workers. And it's a roadblock to peace as they close one door after another trying to hold out the world and its tendency to inundate us with difficulties. Others come at this question from a completely different perspective. Some folks are blissfully unaware of these types of struggles, and yet they do not experience the peace that God desires because they live what, what, what anyone would classify as a charmed life, and yet they think it is of their own creation. We've talked before about people who were born on third base and think they've hit a triple. These are the people who go through life not even realizing that so much of what they've experienced has been given to them. And they don't know what it is to live a life of gratitude and graciousness. Their contentment is easily mistaken for, but is a poor, poor substitute for the peace that surpasses understanding. A life lived in fulfillment of its purpose in Christ. I'm going to ask you to remain in consideration of that question as we continue throughout our sermon today. What are your particular roadblocks to peace? The context for the passage of Scripture you heard Jacob read just a moment ago is that it's the same passage we read last week on Easter Sunday. In fact, the remainder of John chapter 20 begins just a few hours later. It begins Easter Sunday, later in the day, later in the evening, and continues on for the first few days after the first Easter, the original Resurrection Sunday. And what we encounter here are John's version of what every gospel includes. We call them post-resurrection appearances. Those times after Jesus walked victoriously out of the empty tomb, after his victory, his conquered over the grave, he went out and, and, and appeared. Time after time after time, over a period of, of weeks of time, Jesus appeared repeatedly to his loved ones, his disciples, his followers. And he continued to teach them. He continued to reveal his glory so that they might know and believe and grow. In today's passage from John chapter 20, we're going to study how Jesus saves us to lives of peace. And in particular, I hope that we will find here three lessons that help us understand the life of peace to which Jesus calls us and saves us. First of all, Jesus saves us to lives of peace from fear. Peace from fear. You're probably familiar with passages of Scripture from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the New, where a heavenly appearance takes place. Some messenger, or Jesus himself perhaps, appears in the name of the Lord and initially offers a word of calm, a word of comfort, so that listeners and those who observe and behold will not be overwhelmed with their fear. Jesus does something here in his first post-resurrection appearances in John chapter 20. In verse 19, Jesus greets his followers, Peace be with you. There's a reason they're afraid. Even more so than what seems to be an overwhelming experience, many, many times uh, we see uh, Isaiah and we see uh, people who have uh, angel visitations elsewhere in Scripture cowering in fear when the Holy One appears to them. It's an overwhelming experience. But in this particular story, there's an additional layer of fear. Those people who have followed with Jesus most closely, His closest disciples, have remained in Jerusalem. Uh, they have not continued to bear witness. They've not gone home. They've not fled. They seem to have run back to the place where they had been staying before the crucifixion, and they are sort of hunkered down in fear. So 
Sorry, we're dealing with a new microphone this morning. We'll get the old one fixed. I'm not exactly sure how to keep this from doing that, but bear with me. And there they are in this room where they have gathered together and they're trying to avoid those very same people who have turned against Jesus. They're trying to remain hidden from view from those very same people who had convinced Roman authorities to have Jesus killed. There they are living in fear. By the way, this also seems to be a glimpse of a great piece of anxiety that would linger with John's people for years and years to come. Sort of the pivotal, seminal event in the life of of John's people or the Jehanian community, those people whose understanding and experience of Jesus came from the strand of belief that was unique to the fourth gospel, unique to John. They lived in memory of the time when their own synagogue, their own faith community pushed them out and said, we cannot tolerate any longer your testimony about this Jesus of Nazareth. You must go. Someone must win. Someone must lose. It's time for you to exit. They live in this fear uh, in the first days after Jesus and John's people would remain in this type of fear for years and years to come. But in response to such a crippling, paralyzing fear, Jesus responds with the comforting words, Peace be with you. Jesus desires for us to experience his peace. The resurrected Jesus offers this peace. And it's so critical that we understand the operative word in that sentence. Resurrected. The resurrected Jesus, the one who has walked out victorious over the grave, is the one who offers peace. This is not a situation where Jesus is offering us uh, a, a, a an anemic sort of avoidance of pain. This is not a promise that we will go through life with a get-out-of-jail card, with a, with a, a problem-free guarantee. It is instead a battle-tested promise from the one who has borne the sin and strife and sorrow and struggle of the world upon his shoulders and has gone to that cruel instrument of torture and death, the Roman cross, has borne the shame of it all and the isolation from his followers. It is he who has gone all the way into the depths of death and the tomb and has walked out victorious on the other side. It is the resurrected Jesus who offers peace to his followers. No, it is not the avoidance of pain that he promises. It is transformation on the other side. It is presence amidst the pain. It is that I will never leave you nor forsake you that Jesus promises unto us. Jesus saves us to lives of peace in that he saves us. He saves us with peace from fear. Secondly, Jesus saves us to lives of peace from lifeless doubt. Peace from lifeless doubt. This is the story of a disciple named Thomas. And by the way, we've met Thomas before along the way. If you've read through John's Gospel, this this season of preparation for Easter, then you recognize his name. You know that he was very active and very vocal and spoke up from time to time and was always there with Jesus. What we see here is a man who is remembered for what? His doubt. And I I think that's just an an, an interesting aside for those of us who live in the 21st century in a world of not only now a 24-hour news cycle, maybe a 12-hour news cycle, but now also a world of instant update through social media. How many times have you seen someone's life, career, relationship, credibility, undermined or even ruined by one statement. This is how Thomas is remembered, isn't it? No matter how many other times he spoke up, no matter how many other times he was willing to step forward and be with Jesus, we remember him as doubting Thomas. 
for the one moment, and by the way, he, he was absent. He, he missed the appearance of Jesus and, and essentially said in response, well, I'd like to see that for myself. But we remember that as doubt, and, and I don't know about you, but I've been quite unfair and, or quite critical and perhaps unfairly so toward Thomas. I, I know other preachers in the room can attest to this. When preachers turn against preachers for saying things that came out wrong, I think, my God, it's every Sunday for me. Thank you for these gracious people who are willing to, to hear me out. And when I hear leaders turn against leaders and elected officials turn against elected officials and so on and so forth, for one statement, I think, my goodness, is our credibility really that fragile? Over social media this week, there's been something playing out about things that ministers have said to one another. And I, I read one yesterday and it broke my heart. It was attributed to someone who I know to be a good person. Someone who I know to be a, a sold-out, Bible-believing follower of Jesus. But he made one silly statement that does not reflect his character. And he was being beaten up for it. My goodness. That's not the limit of who we are. That's not the extent of who sisters and brothers are in Christ. So Thomas was famous for his doubt, even though he lived a life beyond this one statement. But let's be sure we understand, there are different kinds of doubt. Right? So on the one hand, there is this type of doubt that is, that is minimalistic, and it has a nasty, mean streak to it, it has a sort of snarky tone that it sounds and it is hurtful, perhaps deliberately so. That's one kind of doubt. There are other kinds of doubt. And Thomas seems to be expressing the type of doubt that is better typified as questions leading to life. Just a few days later, after Thomas says, in essence, I'd like to see that for myself, Jesus gives him an opportunity to see it for himself. Jesus appears. Jesus reveals his presence to Thomas and invites him. Touch me. Touch the wounds. And does Thomas? No. What does he say in verse 28? My Lord and my God. The most complete statement of faith in all the Gospels. Now, Simon Peter's confession of faith at Caesarea Philippi from Mark, I think it's chapter 8, is much more famous. He is the first. Jesus asks, who do the people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. He's the first to say that much. But notice how doubting Thomas goes beyond. Not only you are the promised one of old, not only are you my Lord, the one I will follow in this life, you, Jesus, are God. You are God. 2,000 years later, it's hard for us to remember this, but it took the church official several hundred years to be able to come to this point where all of this got ironed out neatly. There were all sorts of questions about who Jesus was and the limits of his authority, but not for Thomas, the one I criticize for his doubt. His question leads to the greatest faith expression anywhere in the Gospels. You are God, he says to Jesus. This type of doubt is not lifeless. It is life-giving as he raises questions so his faith may grow. So this life of, of purpose, this life of peace to which Jesus saves us, is one that is a peace from fear. And secondly, it is a peace from lifeless doubt. But thirdly, this life of peace to which Jesus saves us is also a peace from meaningless 
darkness. Some of you know folks who sort of just wander and meander, drift aimlessly through this life. Sometimes they drift into some place with a steeple on it, Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Sometimes they don't. They have no sense of overarching direction in life. Their life has no story, no narrative, no arc to it. And so they have no peace amidst the meaninglessness of it all. Jesus addresses this head on in verse 21. As he's appearing and revealing his love to those who have been his followers, he says to them in verse 21, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now there's two parts to that statement. It's clearly a commissioning. But there's two parts to that commissioning. First of all, Jesus is saying to the disciples, you are commissioned by the king. Now, this is not just your neighbor asking you to go to the market and pick up some eggs and bring it back to share with the rest of the block. This is not just something that you, you happen upon you know, all in a day's work. This is a commissioning that comes from the creator, uh, God in God's self. The very same one who has sent Jesus now offers us the same commissioning. That is to say, the one who had the authority to send Jesus now sends us in authority and confers that authority upon us. We are commissioned by the authority of the king. But secondly, not only are we commissioned by the king, we are co-missioned with the king. We share in the mission of the king, with the king, and the others whom the king has sent out. All throughout John's gospel, we've seen again and again where Jesus speaks of his own understanding of his commissioning, his purpose. He has come to draw all creation unto himself. He has come to draw his own unto himself, all people unto himself. And now, too, we are sent with the same mission of Jesus to draw all people unto God's self. What a purpose. No more then are we simply wandering about. No, no longer do we sound like listless young people uh, complaining about how they are bored. We have a purpose. We, are a, we have a direction. And it is by any and all means to draw creation unto God's self. I was so pleased yesterday morning. We'll talk about this again in just a moment. I was so pleased yesterday morning that even as the rains fell and the storms threatened and the temperatures had dropped, we still had about 70 volunteers who came out to go across the community to serve on Operation In As Much Day project. People went from the northern end of the county to the southern end of town and all points in between, even on a nasty morning in April. Because we are sent. We've protected that day on our calendar for weeks on end so that we would be able to do this together, to go out and shine a little light and share a little love and, 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 and inform folks of the good news of the name of Jesus to join in that kingdom purpose of drawing all creation unto God's self. This morning we started with a question. What are your roadblocks to peace? Some of us may be dealing with the roadblock of fear. Still others with the roadblock of questions. And even more with the roadblock of meaninglessness. Perhaps for you it's even something else. Some of us have chosen not to listen or have listened but chosen not to respond to what the Spirit of the living and loving God has been speaking into our lives for days, weeks, months, years, even decades. If, if, you, if, you, if you question that, please remember the biblical record of people who ran from God's call for years on end throughout their lives. 
And some of us do the same. I've known Christians who have spent years wrestling and then moving further and further and further away from something they knew they needed to deal with. Some of us need to pivot and go toward something that the Spirit has put in our lives instead of running away from it. I've known Christians who have decided to believe the lie that somehow, some way, they were useless within God's kingdom. And they've, choos- they've chosen to forget the biblical record of people who everyone in society said were powerless, that God used in amazing ways simply because they gave what they had a roof, a bed, a loaf of bread, a couple of fish, simple things that the Lord has used for great good. I've known Christians who have dealt with one physical ailment after another. They've lived in search of understanding of what was medically going on in their lives for decades. And all the while, there has been a word from the Holy Spirit that has been prompting them to set something right in their relationships. There's been a wound that they have chosen to allow to remain year after year after year. And they've never made the connection that maybe, just maybe, if I would stop running away from this distance relationally that I've allowed to persist between me and another sister or brother in Christ, then maybe then this unanswered, undiagnosed physical problem might go away. We know what stress does to our blood pressure. We know what uh, mental hurts do to our bodies. Don't we know that spiritual injury has the same result? I've seen Christians deal with that also. And finally, I've known so many who considered themselves strangers to God. God doesn't want anything to do with me. God wouldn't want me. And what they've never understood is that all that needs to happen is to come home. All that needs to happen is to come home. And that sense of distance, that sense of absence, that sense of uselessness, it begins to fade away as they receive the love, embrace, of the creator, living, and loving God. Jesus has come that we would have life and that abundant, rich, full, meaningful. We don't need to run any further. Jesus has come that we may have lives of peace. Today, if you're ready to receive the peace that Jesus intends for you, We want to give you an opportunity to respond, a chance to come home. Our musicians are going to lead us into a time of response. And as we sing, if today you are making a decision for Christ, if you are recognizing a call upon your life, if you're committed today to moving beyond a roadblock to peace, we want to ask that you'll share that response in the life of this worshiping congregation. As we sing this next song, would you simply step forward and share with us what's happening in your heart today so that we can celebrate with you and continue on life's journey together in Christian fellowship. As we stand now and sing, we do so in hopes that you'll come. Let's sing.